and welcome to this session, Clinical Vaccinology. My name is Alessandro Diana. I'm a pediatrician, infectious disease, and I don't know if I can say so clinical vaccinologist. Uh, and then we will explain what is clinical vaccinology. I like to present my dear colleague, Christian. We have already met uh, twice, I think. Um, uh, I'm the clinical vaccinologist for adults more, and uh, Alessandro is one of the experts for the um, Swiss network to um, advise, actually, physicians. I think he's very modest, so he didn't dare to say that he's an expert, but he definitely is <laughs> in clinical vaccinology, and I let him the word he will start. Uh, the introduction mm -hmm. and yeah. So if you agree for the session today, we're supposed to stay together until 3:40. Long time, right? What I would suggest, if you agree, is that we do one hour and a half, and then we have a 10, 15 minutes break. I think we need this for our brains and physiological needs, maybe. And then we can join again. And for maybe it will be at 40 or 50 minutes and so, and we can finish the session by 3.30. Not suggesting you to go outside to take some sun, but maybe some, some rain because they, the forecasts are very, very dark for this afternoon. So before start, I suggest you, I don't know how some people online. So welcome to the person online, and we will have a round of presentation after uh, we're going to ask you to go on Mentimer. I don't know if you know the app. You can scan the QR code with your phone. It will allow some kind of interaction, but of course, I mean, we can, we can discuss because we are a small group. We have the chance to be a very, very small group. So while you scan your... Uh, I don't need you what we gave you on the lecture. Uh, this funny which is very, very useful. Uh, please. And then I ask you to ask me. Yes. And then we understand we thought we would have some Swiss chocolates. Oh, I thought we would have some. Because of sugar chocolate. Figures under. <laughs> if this is only by chocolate, then it's uh... <laughs> how to get the attention, especially after smartphone. And we suppose that you guys, you have been, I mean, a very busy, busy time these last uh, days, right? So, everybody got the mentiment? Hello? You are gone. If you want some kind of interaction and you have a phone, you can, with your camera, just scan the QR code and then we can, we can start. I think people are, right? So we have to speak up a little bit over here. Wishing that people on Zoom, they can also scan the QR code. Very good. Of course, now you don't see anything because there is no question or not. That's normal, yeah. No, it's not, no need to install the application, nothing. With the QR code, you just go on, but you don't see any question now because the question will appear when I put on the slide. Let, let's try. I'm going to show you. So, Oh, I was even back. Sorry. So this is us, Christian and myself. We did this kind of presentation, working at uh, uh, University Hospital of Geneva. And Infobac is the platform of expert where Christian and I, with other experts in Switzerland, we actually answer questions, uh, vaccine-related questions to healthcare professionals. We going to talk about a little bit of that. So now, just to try the maintenance form, if you can put it on where country you come from. You don't see the question? Oh yeah, you see the question. Yeah. So US, Switzerland, States, Iran, yeah. India, Denmark, very good. So we see all over the world, Cameroon, excellent, very good, Nepal, Nigeria, El Salvador, very, very good. 
And another couple of questions for you. Many of we asked you, hello, where, what is your job? Position? Are you in policy maker position? Are you? You can choose. Let's see. Position in the industry, all right, regulatory theory, clinical researcher, program manager, program manager. What is NIP? National Immunization. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, then we have finding, clinical trialist, we have a scientist. Okay, very good. Coordinator, chief medical officer, biotech. Excellent. And a pharmacist. Very good. Very and then, and then we perfect regional organization. So, general question Are you exposed in your daily practice uh, to vaccinology question from health care professionals? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> No, but eventually you would be exposed, exposed. You would be interested, okay. The person would be eventually exposed. The person is not, uh, doesn't receive, but is interested in the workshop. Very good. Nobody is in the wrong workshop. No, <laughs> this is the time to change. Very good. And I guess, yeah, so. Generally speaking, before we give you what we think would be the objective of this workshop, what would be your two or three expectations of this workshop? Put it on. Yeah. So that could be how to build the network experts. Any question? Any question, any expectation that you will have? Okay, two answer. Oh, why does it doesn't show? Okay, let's see. Okay. Uh, Oh, thank you. So, understanding by best practice from clinical vaccinology and private management, discuss overreaching teams and way to think, causality assessment, yeah, totally correct, innovation vaccine development, good resource to use, understand vaccine user concern, improve skills, very good, and to be more aware of patient perspective, yes, maybe some vaccine hesitancy there. Then we learn about clinical vaccinology and obtain evidence based answer. Find more knowledge. Very, very good. So, very quickly, I think we have time for that. We'll have to do our next. Okay. Before giving the objective, if we can make a quick round. You know, just give us your name, tell your profession, and say it again very quickly would be your expectation. So we can interact. You first. Hello, I'm Amela. I'm from Cameroon, and I work as regional coordinator for the immunization program. Um, we, the reason why I'm here is just to really understand aspects of clinical vaccinology and also being able to provide evidence-based answers to healthcare workers and how to coin information for the general population. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Sornendu Kaviraj from Janava Biopharmaceuticals in India. I work for vaccine development in uh, R&D and uh, my expectation would be, you know, Rollout of new vaccines after clinical trials and the implementation programs. To implement, and yeah. very good. 
I don't know if you have your answer on that, but it's fine. And in case you do not dedicate to the uh, during the discussion. Yes, yes. Hi, Parada Allen, um, a Pfizer in the US. So I lead some of the viral vaccines and mRNA platform and M uh, vaccine programs in Pfizer. And so I'm in this uh, session because I'm ro also rolling things into clinical studies. And so just to better understand clinical vaccinology. Thank you. All right, I'm Sarah Meyer. I'm from the US CDC and I work with our national immunization program. And I'm, I serve as the chief medical officer and I do rotate on a clinical service, but I also get consulted as like an SME. So I, I think my, um, my uh, expectations would be kind of just uh, best approaches, approaches or practices for yeah. these types of issues. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Mila, and I'm a clinical researcher, and I'm based in Nepal. So uh, I've been recently involved in a lot of uh, vaccine studies, and so I get a lot of questions from the participants and sometimes from colleagues, so like how to be best uh, suited to answer those questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, Dennis Christensen from Denmark. Um, I'm in, in R&D uh, of adjuvant systems. Uh, we don't do any clinical development programs ourselves. The adjuvant is nothing without the antigen. So, but, but I often get questions when our collaborators start clinical development programs and um, hope that I could can get a more background what their reflections are in this okay. aspect. Thank you. My name is Marie Louise Christensen. I am a medical doctor and I work as a chief medical officer at the Danish Medicines Agency. Uh, I work with pharmacovigilance. I'm primarily here for the adverse events. Very good. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Laurie Yates. Um, I'm a molecular microbiologist working in early R&D largely. Um, so I'm here for the opportunity to see things really from the other end of this perspective. My company runs some clinical trials. So to improve my understanding there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Reza uh, from Iran. I'm a, a pharmacist and biotechnologist in a private company. We are doing clinical trials from our products and doing pharmacovigilance studies and the causality assessment is very important here. And also the people concerned about uh, vaccine uptake and also his density is very important. Okay. Thank you. Great. Hi, I'm Sean Marie. I'm a program manager for the Dutch um, immunization program. Um, I would like to learn much <laughs> more about the causality assessment of side effects. I also would like to learn about communication of side effects, like yeah. how we, I think it's always quite one way, like, yeah. no, there's no, con and I think there must be more to say to the public to gain Trust, actually, to be open. Uh, we have a, uh, our institute is apart from the, the, the um, so I don't see also, I get, I get the notification like a child died after, uh, um, you know, intrauterine death after maternal vaccination. I get those, but I don't know what happens with it sometimes. And that always leaves me behind with a question like, you know, like it leaves you behind with an open end. So I'm, yeah, and I would like to learn more about what happens after that and, and what can I do as a program manager to... Um... Thank you so much. Very good inputs. Thanks. So I'm Danielle. I work for CEPI and we provide funding to various vaccine developers. Um, part of my role is to advise on the regulatory registration pathways. And so for me, I think it, it'll be good to hear other concerns that we're not already incorporating into our clinical design yeah, for nice. like the end user. What is the end user interested in terms of endpoints yes. and, and disease aspects that we yeah. could incorporate sooner? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. My name is Michael Lewis and I'm from Nigeria. I'm an infectious disease physician, currently working uh, as a physician in an industrial hospital. Mm -hmm. But in the past um, five years, I've worked as a clinical trialist, uh, leading uh, vaccine trials for emerging infectious diseases. Uh, I would like to uh, learn more about uh, causality assessments and how to play a role as a member of uh, DSMB. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, my name is Maryam. I'm uh, from NIH US. I'm a physician by training, but I currently work as a clinical trialist. We work on the pipeline from the initial product with basic science and then work with the team with animal studies, pre-IND application, IND. And when it comes to phase one, it's my job as a medical officer at NIH. So I usually, you know, work with the team to go through the pipeline, but my main job is to start phase one. And I'm here to learn more about the clinical aspect of vaccinology and vaccine development. Phase four, phase five. <laughs> Not personally, I don't have any experience with phase four. <laughs> three, one through three, three so uh, far. Three, That's more than enough for me. <laughs> Jose, thank you. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, please, please. Jose from El Salvador, uh, and I I work at my country's NIH. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm with NITAC also, and uh, our R I IRB also, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm a P P pediatric in infectious disease yes. specialist, and I work at the NIH in the re re research branch. So I do a bit of everything. I see. One or two expectations of this workshop? Uh, learn from you guys <laughs> as, as much as I can. So mm -hmm. I, I can go back and very, put it very into practice. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. So I think we'll be learned together today, right? And the objectives that we, 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 we define is just the design approach for providing the, this, you know, any, any uh, question with vaccine related question to uh, for patients, sorry. And what would be uh, these different approaches? What to what are our referential when we give an answer uh, for a vaccine related question? What would you use? Which kind of evidence may be So, if we go, all right. So what, everything we do in life, whatever we, we want to do, we want to set up uh, a group or something or an objective, we should identify what is the need. And of course, the need depends on your uh, area where you live. So you should be very aware of what are the need of your healthcare professional or your surrounding. This is really, really, really important. And then how to answer with an expertise, right? And how to design what we can call an, a, a network. So very briefly here, I'm gonna, we're gonna show you the story of Infobac that was born in Switzerland, thanks to our colleague, Clérame Sigrist, which is, is the first vaccinologist who had the chair in, in the Europe, in Geneva. And Keran, as a pediatrician, infectious disease, she was overwhelmed once she was a vaccinologist. Everybody was calling her. I have this question. Dun, dun, dun. So I think at the end of the day, she had like tons of phones and she was overwhelmed because she was the only expert. So maybe you could be the only expert in your area. Maybe there is more. But the danger when you, when you are the expert, everybody uh, comes to you, okay? Now, you would be very happy if you have another expert, okay? And because we can share the work. And usually if you go with uh, phones or even email, um, the other person didn't understand what I told him at the phone. It happens, okay? But I didn't say that. Oh, yes, you did. Oh, I was, I misunderstood and the same thing, Alex, I sent you the email, you didn't answer me, oh, sorry, I didn't see the email. And then you may have this kind of situation where in your area you may have a lot of experts, everybody's experts in vaccinology. And this is a totally confusion because you may receive a question from a colleague, they ask you a question, you say whatever you want, and then you give your answer. 
as you know, is a little dyspraxia. So you may have people say, well, Alex, I just asked a Christian and she said, not, she didn't give me the same answer. And this is very frustrating what, uh, to confront uh, expert opinion. So, what do we need? We need to be patient. I am very, very sorry at this stage. I forgot people on Zoom. Is there any possibility that people on Zoom, how many people do we have? I think there are three of us. I don't know if you can hear us. Oh, we are, I'm so sorry. Just for the, a very quick presentation. I'm sorry. I forgot. No worries. So, will you please see, what is your name, Ellen? Yeah, hi. Ellen, can you tell a little bit about you very shortly and one or two expectations? Yeah, so I work with the Public Health Agency of Sweden, and we have a functional uh, email address to which uh, people can send questions that are vaccine-related. Okay. Um, and me and my colleagues in our unit work on a roster to, to answer these questions. So my objective for participating in this session is to just give me more um, good answers. <laughs> to yeah. all sorts of questions. So it's both from um, the public and from public health nurses and doctors. Thank you, Let me see Gupta. Hi, I'm Rachna, uh, Rachna Gupta. I'm an infectious disease physician, uh, practiced for many years before I joined industry, um, I, where I work in vaccine development and uh, actually I still continue to see patients. So um, I would love to have, you know, uh, improved communication strategies uh, that would help me both uh, with both seeing patients and with my uh, clinical uh, development work. Thanks. Thank you so much. Divya? Hi, I'm Divya Shah. Um, I work at a funding organization, so the Wellcome Trust, and I guess we look at um, kind of clinical trials. Uh, we look to fund clinical trials, but also so we have to kind of view the protocols occasionally as part of the application. And um, some of my work is focused on regulatory system strengthening uh, in relation to clinical trials and also uh, building clinical trial capabilities, particularly in low resource settings. So what that's what I'd like to get from the workshop is how kind of just to understand uh, clinical trials and, and particularly vaccine clinical trials um, better. Very good. Thank you so much. And when we have the discussion, anytime um, be comfortable to put your mic on and you, I mean, you are with us. So going back to what we do need as an expert, you might know the CANMED, which is a framework and defines what these, what needs a medical expert. Uh, we need, of course, to, to have some knowledge, to be scholar, but not only. Knowledge is not everything, right? We also do need to communicate. Definitely, I have a problem with this. Okay. So we were in collaboration, of course. So we will need a lot of competence to be a medical expert. So this is the story with the Infovac. Um, Infovac now is, I think, two, 23 years. So the founder is Clara Sigrist. She has this brilliant idea to create a platform where anybody, healthcare professional, not the public, unfortunately, we not have the capacity, will send this question on vaccine. So the question goes on a server, okay, with an address, which is infovac.ch, and then according to the expert who is in duty, is a one-week duty, you receive your question. For example, this week, neither you, neither I, we are on, <laughs> on call, these are other colleagues, for Switzerland, 8 million of persons, we need 9 experts we share, because also there is a German part and the French part. And we know in advance which is what, what are our schedule. Okay. So we receive the answer, the expert, the product expert, 
If I invert the expert on duty, when I answer to you, I copy paste my answer to my colleagues. Okay. This is a kind of a peer review expertise. And usually it happens that maybe Christian say, oh, Alex, I don't think you gave the right answer. Do you know about this new recommendation? And so we come back to the person, say, you know, I come back to my answer, blah, 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 because my colleague. So we also cross, have a, a cross expertise between the experts. <clears throat> Yes, please interrupt. Yeah, please. Can you turn on your micro? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I was just wondering that process, uh, would you uh, have considered interacting with your peer before sending out the message? Of course. So this actually happened when you are the beginner in InfoVac. I remember when I began in InfoVac. I think for one month or two, I was sending the question to Kiran, may I answer this? Is it correct? And of course, usually that happens even between us because you, you may have tough question. Usually, you know, you have a, this row of questions are always the same and it's very easy. But whenever we do hesitate, we, we just ask each other, are you okay with this kind of answer, especially for the Dutch you know, answer? I don't know what is your yeah. input. Though. Yeah, definitely. There is kind of a, a time com component to it. So um, the uh, physicians await an answer in the 24 to 48 hours. Um, this is why there's only one person on call because you kind of dedicate your time to answering the questions. Uh, but then definitely if you're not sure, before saying something and then going back and say, oh, basically I told you I did something very wrong. Uh, you might want to consider asking your colleagues yeah. first, right? Definitely. Yeah. Yes, of course. Do you have a base of like frequently asked questions with already defined answers to facilitate the process so the back and forth isn't really yeah. There was a struggle these 20 years old how to you know create a data the database for the frequent questions. So to answer to you, yes, we do have. Actually, I think what we have now, we have our personal database, you know. I know that I did a file with the frequent question, so I can, you know, reframe the, the, the question. I don't know, I tried to tell you to, through to, uh, to ask chat GPT to give me a hand how we can do for to share, and maybe we need some kind of uh, AI to help us, uh, but as of today, we cannot generate automatic question, if I may say, because this could be, you know, one thing. But we do have a frequent um, asked question. And what we do, you will see. So first of all, we have a website, InfoVac. So people, even public, can go there, find a Swiss recommendation where you can find a lot of things. As an example, Switzerland, as April, does not recommend any more general recommendation from COVID. It's just individual, blah, blah, all this kind of thing. You need the Swiss plan vaccination, you find it there. Uh, what we also do, I think is the next slide. Yeah. We have the monthly newsletter. And I think this is one of the most appreciated tools that our um, abonnees, I mean, the pharmacists and doctors, they like. Because what happened? We do have news from the authorities. What have changed on recommendation, for example, is COVID. Do we have a out of stock situation? You know, I don't have any more of this vaccine. Do we have a solution? And then to answer to your question, we have a section for, you know, the frequent asked question of the month. Because if you see that you have more than three, four actual uh, questions that come in back, maybe there is a point, and we put it on the monthly newsletter. Monthly newsletter is also for people who have, um, I don't know how you say it. Yeah, you sign up. I uh, sign up. Subscription. Yeah. Just for the maybe for the financial setup. I think we have to disclaim this. Uh, health, only for healthcare worker, if you want to sign up to Infobac, and it's 25 euro a year, the fee. 
and then you can access the expert anytime with the guarantee, exactly, this is the one in Quebec, that you will have an answer in 48 hours by email. Very appreciated by uh, professional because they can show to the patient. In Switzerland now we have pharmacists that they perform vaccination and they love to make sure, so if they have a question, if they do that, and they do two vaccines in a row, and then they can show to their clients. So this is very, very efficient. Of course, thank you. It's just a piggybacking on that question, because the frequently asked questions, I think, is from the perspective of the healthcare professionals trying to find something that they could. Uh, do you, in on, on the expert end, you said you have your own database of frequent, do you share that among each other so that if, no, well, just so that the, 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 you know, in terms of the um, consistency of the responses, if it wasn't a frequently asked question, but yeah. it's something that you've gotten and maybe if someone yeah. asks your, your expert colleague, they would give some so what, easier, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So what do we have? We have our personal, what I call my database. It's maybe how I phrase the answer. You know, we have a personal way to answer people. So I know that I like to have my database, so I copy-paste the kind of text because we say, dear colleague, thank you for the question to Infovac, did it, you know, you know, well, this is one thing. Whenever we disagree, because there is also disagreement between experts, we say, no, I don't agree on this point, and then we have to argue. Usually we have meetings, we have like annual meetings. These turn out to be Zoom meetings because it's more easier to connect people from Zurich to, to Geneva, also the expert. And we may, you know, solve the solution and also try to find an agreement because as an info, we would like to be to have a sort kind of agreement between us. Yes, we do. And now, info back is, yes, and, please. And the other thing is, so because you are copied into all answers in every language that has been given, you have kind of your own database and you can keep the ones where you were we're not sure or whatever, and then you know you you can and everybody is kind of organizing it by you know differently how you want to store the knowledge, and so basically we have one on in your email account, <laughs> but then yeah. A question yes. from online. Can you tell us your name? Yeah, so this is Helen. Um, first of all, I'm just happy to hear that other countries work in the same way that we do in Sweden. Um, with first sending a question to a trusted colleague uh, or expert in that field to sort of double check the answer. Uh, and that's also actually a very good continuous learning process. So uh, we all have our expertise in different diseases, but me being forced to answer questions about pneumococcal vaccinations and being able to double check the answers with a colleague, it really gives me a sort of a basal basic knowledge in other areas. So that's really, really good. Um, a question, um, yeah, maybe the question later, but with the F, uh, frequently asked questions uh, in our agency, we have a shared Word document where frequently asked questions or just really like good questions and good answers get saved. So it's not a copy paste of incoming and outgoing answers, but it's a, like you generalize the question or put it in a more yeah, general way, and then you can paste in your answers so that your colleagues can use the same type of answer if they have the same type of question. But what we also do is we use this internal document to create F FAQs on our external web page. So it's like a first step of providing the answers earlier so that people don't have to contact us to get the answer. Mm -hmm. um, but to my question, uh, you said that you uh, CC'd everyone on all outgoing questions and answers. Isn't that so many emails? It's a lot of emails. Uh, yeah. So the question is, if when we are you're copied into all answers, if it's a lot of emails. So yes, it is a lot of emails. So <laughs> I, I have a, a specific email address just for these questions, yeah. because otherwise um, you will get kind of overwhelmed. And I think this is perhaps also the reason why there might not be a shared word database. For one is that it's different languages in Switzerland, which makes things difficult because obviously you have to answer in German and Italian, but Alessandro is doing it in French. Um, and then uh, the other thing is, uh, it is the volume is so high. 
Um, and then everybody has a, a way of thinking which ones he or she thinks would be important to keep. So I think this is why it's more complicated. And then the best ones, they are in the newsletter, yeah. which is kind of yeah. the way of filtering. But I think it's a very nice idea to have a oh, huge yeah. common database. To put in common, because this could be also pedagogical material, of course. But Ellen, I have a question to you. Did you set up this database or is a wish? You you have it, right? Uh, the frequently asked questions database. No, it's it's just a word document, but we added like headlines um, and uh, what do you call it? An index. Yeah. So that you could just jump to questions on jingles, and then it's like frequently asked question. Um, when is the evaluation ready? When can I get the vaccine? And then standard answer. The evaluation is ongoing, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. I think we should ask this to our webmaster because I think maybe we need some IT competence, which yeah. fortunately we are not. We have not so lots yeah, I, I can send you uh, our Word document and a link to oh, yeah. our <laughs> frequent class, just as a comparison and inspiration or just. At the end of your, our presentation, we have our email, emails. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. So. This is the kind of email that we have. We are not going to go through this, but it's, you know, this is me, answer the question, say hello to your colleague. I put here the question and I give my answer and all my colleagues are in copy, in copy, paste of the answer. So one thing about Infobank that is, is an issue, it's more a financial issue, but it's important. Clemency List, when she built the first version of Infobank, she had all the pharma say, oh, we can sponsor you. But then you can see the problem of conflict of interest, because, you know, you may say, I'm working for the pharma, so something is wrong. And for her, independency from the pharma was a rule. So at the very beginning, you have to find some friends, or at least for the proof of concept, that is what she did. Two friends say, oh, okay, let's do it together. But at one point you say, you're very dear, my friend, but you know, this is a lot of work. When we are on duty, easily we may have two hours a day. And when you are a beginner, I had also three, four hours a day at the night, checking in the book, is it correct or not? So this is work. What she had, Infobac very soon with the proof of concept, she went to the authorities, our official federal health, and said, listen guys, this is the job that we do. We give support to professional for any vaccine related question. And the Health Office Federal of Switzerland recognized Infobac as a public, you know, use utility. And so whenever we we have um, we are paid by week, and I can describe to the disclaimer, we take like 900 euros a week, okay? But we are paid from the official federal of health. No pharma, there is no logo of pharma in there. And we don't have to, you know, we are free. We are really independent to see in our world. And I think it's very important. Infobac Switzerland, there's a baby, which is Infobac France, that they got inspired. But, you know, you have to see what is your reality, what is your, your environment. They couldn't do it with the Minister of Health or whatever. So they are sponsored by the farmer. That's the way. So Robert Cohen, which is the founder of Infobank Friends, you know, he found a way to have a lot of pharma there, so not just one. And they disclaim that the experts are sponsored by the pharma. I think you had a question or input. Oh, nice. Can you put your microphone for the people on Zoom side? Yes. Yeah, we have kind of the same system, but it's not and apart, like you have an apart an organization outside of the governmental, uh, the public health institute. We have in the public health institute the medical advisors, or like 
around 12 working only on the children immunizations and we have a group for the adult vaccinations and they are paid by the government well by the public health institute they make also the guidelines for the vaccines um, and uh, the e-learnings for the people who get accreditation and everything so they have a combined job to do that and to do all the questions yeah. and uh yeah but, but that's question, that could be kind of it's yeah sorry but these questions are for the healthcare professional yeah well also yeah. sometimes for parents yeah oh, okay yeah but we also have a, a, a telephone line and a, a chat function for parents. So, like, kind okay. of, a, yeah. I have a question. So, the, the 25 euro subscription fee, is it paid to government? No, by the physician or the pharmacist, by yeah. the user. Well, who is the receiver? Platform. Oh, the, the, the InfoVac platform. So, oh. in the, yeah, it's all, yeah, oh, very good question. So we are paid by uh, government, blah, blah, blah. but then since we have other expenses, I mean, if we have a webmaster, you know, we have a, uh, we have an assistant, so we have extra fee, and the twenty five francs they are for Infobac, but Infobac now is in, if you know, in the with the university hat okay so the university because you have some kind of regulation has all the view of your money and what's going on actually we are we have also a path where the, uh, the, the official health of switzerland you know pays the university who pays the fee to the expert so it's a very kind of transparent or maybe filter and what we do have can happen, of course, that you might have extra money, especially with COVID. We have a lot of people they want to go come to Infobac, pharmacists, and so on. And we can also use this money for education purpose, for trainings, for example. Okay. And this is our setup. So, of course, the financial setup, I would say, one point should be transparent, but again, according to the regulation of your country. So, it's, uh, you said it's nine of you. And how many hours per, per day or how often do you take rotations? Uh, so it would be, what would say, once a month. Once a month we are in duty. For a week. For, for a week. week. For a week. From Friday night to the other Friday. It's Friday to Friday. Okay. And we receive, so it really depends. It's very seasonal. During summer break, you may have like three to five questions for the French one. So if we are the German part, I would say it could be 10 to 15 at the lowest question per day. During COVID, I won't tell you. I think I was dying because we had like, no, seriously, once I counted 52 questions a day, one day, it was a big thing. But regularly we do have, I would say, depending, the interval of confidence is very wide. To five to fifteen, eighty, depending. Yeah. And um, so, for you, is there any way to know who is asking you the question? So, can you see who that professional background is? Yeah, yeah, you see. I mean, the because they are signed up, and then when you get the email, you know if it's a pharmacist or if it's a pediatrician or a GP. Um, and then they often send you data from the patient and really specific questions to one patient that they are seeing in, in office. So yeah. this is only available for professionals. Yes. There is no yeah. public access, yeah, right? Professional. Okay, so that's the good thing because there is a filter. But a good or a bad thing, right? <laughs> because the problem, I mean, it would be nice, right, to be able also to provide to the public. And so for this is the platform online where you have information on the disease because people you know, don't remember what tetanus is in Switzerland um, and then the vaccines. And so it's, it's, this is for both so that the patients or the non-professional healthcare professional can read something and learn something and, and have the same information. Uh, but then for the specific questions, there is, I mean, you have, like we have the, another job next to it. <laughs> um, and so obviously if you already have 20 questions a day from professionals, then it's going to be, so there is another platform connects professional no, website that we showed you, right? The website, the info yeah. website, this is for everybody. And then you subscribe and then you can ask the question really uh, like uh, on a platform that is not visible to others except to the expert. Please.
Yeah. Because you have to go, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm just wondering what level of uh, participant information or data do they share with you? And I'm also wondering whether they are covered in terms of non-disclosure agreements and, um, you know, confidentiality to share that level of data with uh, InfoVac. Yeah. Usually, so first of all, for the confidentiality, um, I would say most, let me say most, but all professional Switzerland must have a secure email. This is the first thing. Um, usually, patient, uh, the pharmacists or doctors, they don't give you the, the, the identity of the patient. You don't need to know this is Diana Alex, 52 years old. A male patient, 51, and they give you, you know, just uh, medical condition. So this is the first thing. And we usually ask for that. Don't put personal detail, you know, uh, with names and, uh, and, and birth. This is one thing. And uh, so first part of your question, sorry, I just forgot. Yeah, it's just about confidentiality. Yeah, 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 yeah. And to have uh, and, and secure the email, not everyone has, of course, in theory. But now I see with, since Confidentiality is, is, you know, growing up and up. A lot of physicians and pharmacists, they do that. Yeah. I just want to make also a point for pharmacists. It's true that we cannot answer to patients, but now in 20 years that we have this in Switzerland, even the patient knows that, oh, I can go ask the question to my pharmacist because the pharmacist, if is not knowledgeable, he will ask one to like. The other day, I also saw a question. I have a question from my client who on purpose asked me to ask Infobac expert, blah, 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 blah. blah. <laughs> and it's very, if we do, you know, a promotion for pharmacists whenever, because they don't perform all vaccines for regulation. But whenever we, we you know, we, we train them, we say, you know, you, you can do promotion of vaccine. So they, they are knowledgeable, even of uh, HPV vaccine, they, they cannot perform, and they can give the advice to their client. Okay. Um, Go. Oh, sorry. Two questions. Two questions. Go ahead. First, if, 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 if I ask you in English, you, you, you will answer me in English or yes. only in French? So we do. Actually, what we have, so one thing, we usually accept uh, a professional from Switzerland. You should okay. be on a board of professional from Switzerland. Um, we actually had a question from Clerane at the very beginning, because people from France, from the French side, they would say, well, we, you know, we have a question, is it the same thing? So since she she was scared of overload because Switzerland is eight million, France is sixty million, and then if Germany, can you imagine? Mm -hmm. So you could we in Switzerland, this is a tiny little country, we could be overwhelmed with a demand abroad yes. that we are not supposed to give. But for example, I know that Leran for years for every person who is interested to 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 see how it works it too. Um, you may ask to have, you know, a one month period to see how it is, which kind of question we, we do have. And also to help you guys and share information from our experience to how to do it and do this. But actually it's from the physician and pharmac pharmacist certified in Switzerland. Ah, okay. I think perhaps for the for the purpose of time, that this uh, yes. advancing a bit. Um, uh, so you are like in a case scenario. Uh, so no, you are now today on call uh, for free uh, to plan for back. Now, and you got your first question, which is um, a physician assistant. So the physician writes you and he said, my assistant, she injected the first doses of MMRV in a 13 month old girl in the muscle instead of um, under the skin. Uh, simultaneously, um, and so the question is, what do you answer? Do you say, so you can go on your phone, right? And yes. Yeah. Do you say, hey, what's your pity where I now have to start the vaccine schedule all over again? 
Or you say, oh, no worries, the vaccinated vaccines, they will find their way. Or you say, um, it's inactivated vaccines that could be injected subcutaneously, but not the other vaccine types. Or do you say, I have no idea, and I'm going to look for some information. So please, A, B, C, or D. So you want that on the internet? Okay. Just, yeah, uh, you lost the you lost the code. Um, uh, you can if you go up, you see up there the six six nine nine. Yeah. Yeah. Six or four one. I think Claire Ann made a very good case for this answer. Uh, sorry. Claire Ann made a very good uh, explanation for this answer. They will find their way. Perfect. So the ones who didn't know and were looking for information, they found the information. They are now also voted for <laughs> um, So yes, uh, indeed. Um, here you. Oh, sorry. sorry. No problem. Um, so you see uh, the site of um, yeah. intramuscular um, injections, uh, which is here, and then in babies who cannot walk yet you can do it in the yeah. in the thighs That's here fine. we try to avoid um so we now just do it in the arms here or in the thigh? Yeah. yeah exactly but it's not in the bottom no. right okay. exactly no. uh, exactly um and then for the subcutaneous you see how to inject um just as an example and um then if we continue indeed um you are right here back again just to show you the child cannot walk yet where you can inject it. Um, but then they, uh, like vaccinated the vaccines, they find their way. Um, and in subcutaneous tissue, there are very few um, antigen presenting cells as well. So in the muscle, there's more cells you can use, take the antigen, bring it to the flow. So it's not even uh, as possible. But on the other hand, oh, sorry, on the other hand, never do inactivated vaccines with alum in the um, subcutaneous knee. So this is absolutely not. The right answer so no because um this can do some granuloma and some real uh, bad reactions so this was the answer and very good. so we may conclude very practical question because we have some question that people they maybe did a mistake in an activated vaccine is subcutaneous so it doesn't work as a thumb of rule for someone who is not that much knowledgeable we may say you can inject all vaccine intramuscular, okay? Intramuscular, I mean, is more, you have, it's deeper that if you can do it subcutaneously, but an MMR vaccine, MMRV, can be injected intramuscular. And so we have a lot of colleagues now, pediatrician, that they say to their assistant or their themselves, we inject all vaccine intramuscularly, so never mistake. So then in the second part, so now we showed you kind of the, the um, expert-based um, recommendations that you can give your colleagues um, and, for example, to, to help them to provide the, the approaches how to, you know, talk to patients about um, catch-up vaccine doses. And now we would like to go into the other objectives um, using more of these cases to be a little bit more interactive and to keep you more awake and not in the food coma um, in which you might be. Causality assessment, the risk benefits balance, and then probably after the break, um, some cases on vaccine hesitancy. The ones who had some more expectations about uh, clinical trial, uh, vaccine rollout, etc. cetera, um, we are not really gonna cover this during this session. Um, we are happy to answer questions, but it's more about really clinical cases uh, and showing you first how you can organize you with other people and experts to answer to other people, but then also how you can use, for example, what you saw last week, uh, the WHO um, causality assessment scale, et cetera, um, to answer uh, clinical relevant questions. It was the last example uh, where it was supposed to be injected IM, intramuscular. It was supposed to be injected in the subcutaneously. Just a, but it was injected in IM. the muscle. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, so it was the SC, but it was injected IM. IM, exactly. So will that be recorded as a deviation? 
Um, I'm not sure if this is if you announced. This is announced to. Well, the question was, was that be recorded as a deviation? But So it's not no. that I can like, try, right? This is. Uh, yeah, it's still, it's not a but still, it will not be recorded as a deviation. Yeah. And it's. Their safety monitoring. You say you have to report administration. Yes. Yeah. 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 But again, since live attenuated vaccine may be injected intramuscularly, this is not an error by okay. definition. But if according, I mean, we also tell to all the physicians whenever you can always report anything you do as an error to the pharmacovigilance, you know. But usually we don't report to the pharmacovigilance for an expected side effect, like a fever. So that should be unusual uh, and an unusual side effect. But definitely for a vaccine like MMR, who has been injected intramuscularly, there is no error by definition because we have the knowledge and we know that we can inject it in the, mus in the muscle. And uh, do we want to prevent that in the future and like, try to train the a clinician again that this should not happen. We, may I answer? Yeah, yeah. yes. The, 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 the thing is that this vaccine can, can be applied both ways in the muscle or in the fat. Uh, so, either way, it's, it's, it's not a mistake. The 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 optimal route is in, on on the fat in the fat, but if it's put in the muscle, no problem. It's okay too. So there is no mistake. So we we don't have to make an an issue uh, and a report about it because there there was no mistakes. Be, be, because it can be put both ways. And I think the subcutaneous story came from the initial trials where they used it subcutaneously. Um, and then so it was approved for subcutaneously, but you can give it intramuscularly. But then always, especially when physician assistants give vaccines in our country, and then there is something that is not by the books 100%, then, you know, people are asking questions. And so that's why this question came to, to our ears, basically. Uh, but in the in the package insert, it must be I M or I C. Yes, both should be mentioned. Both. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. It is both. We had an expert here from side effects reporting. It was you or somebody who was asking maybe your side. Yeah. Do you have an expertise on reporting to the pharmacovigilance or opinion about that? What would be your input? I don't work with the bank this morning. I, my work starts with the uh, information. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, microphone. Oh, yeah, the microphone. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'll repeat. I, I'm not an expert in the national reporting systems. My work starts once it's reported to the uh, uterine vigilance, and we need, we do signal de signal detection. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 maybe yeah. So, so repeat the question again. What, or what was the level, the threshold for for reporting? Yeah, maybe yeah. The word of it's, threshold. When should I report a side effect or suppose within the EU? Within the EU, yeah. Because and this this may vary according to where you are. Exactly. But within the EU, if if a drug, including a vaccine, is licensed within two years, it's under uh, additional monitoring, which means that you have to report everything that which is. Uh, serious, non-serious, expected, and non-expected. Everything for the first two years. After the first two years, you have to report that which is serious and that which is not expected. So uh, previously unknown side effects. That That is a general rule. And that fits really well if something is introduced and picked up by very few patients. If something is introduced and picked up by the entire world, like COVID vaccines, yeah. Uh, reporting every case of redness or aching, <laughs> which you're supposed to do because it's within the first two years, that will swarm the system. The system was not cut out for that. But, but as a general rule, within the first two years, everything after that, serious and unknown side effects. Yeah. Yeah. 
We don't have so may, may I ask, so people. what did you do during Corona when you were swamped? <laughs> we uh, developed the backlog. Um, <laughs> and and, and uh, we, we had a triage system where, where all the serious side effects were picked out and, and looked at. And we're still assessing redness and soreness at the injection site. Yeah. Or maybe that's something for the coffee. But uh, do you also do you look at um, individual vaccinations, or you do also look at a series until one year? You look like you you you. Uh, you look you look for both, and and if if it's a combination vaccine and it's reported, then it's sometimes it's really hard to attribute it to a specific component, and that's just fact of life. Uh, if it's reported for one of the, the individual components, you would be more likely to attribute it to that. And that can in turn make it quite difficult to, to detect whether a certain adverse event is also related to another component, because the known component will always be the more likely. Uh, like, oh, in the second of the series, there are always more more side effects than the third or the fourth. That is quite interesting yes. to know. So, yeah. <laughs> you would absolutely be able to detect that. <laughs> Give me the word. You would be able to detect that. Yes. Very good. So, what we would suggest you? I think we need this fifteen minutes break for small talks, physiological needs, whatever, and coffee. And if you agree, we come back here in 2.30. So we will have perfect, in perfect time. Is it okay? Yes. 15 minutes? If we don't agree. <laughs> Very good. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> so if you agree, we can go with clinical situation again. Of course, because we have clinical data set. Those type of questions that we receive in AFABAC, actually. But anytime, feel free to interrupt and give you your, your own question in case. So you receive now this picture from a colleague. And this is Alexia. So those are real cases. We just changed the name. Four years old, presenting a painful rush, 36 hours after the fifth dose, dose sorry, of the beta and polio. I don't know if you can see the rash. Mm -hmm. Here it's red, a little bit swollen, and painful. The other information that are given to you, actually, I don't know. Oh, here. So many items. Next slide, please. Okay. So would you presume that this reaction is most likely an allergic reaction and never hyperimmunization phenomenon, which is known under the name of Arthur's phenomenon, which is usually due to the tetanus antigen? Is it an extensive swelling of unknown etiology? We know treatment required. Or is it an injection-induced bacterial infection? That's your commenting range, and you can choose. Oh, oops. What happened? Oh. What do you do? You can ask the question, of course. Go ahead with the micro. Thank you. The, the thing is, I need more info about it. I need to know if the kid has a fever. Yeah. And I need to know if his arm is hot and... Yeah. and 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 with pain, yeah. So that I can say which one of of the answers is the right one. Exactly. Whenever we want our causality assessment of what it is, we need information. The first information we had that this was a painful rush. Okay. First of all, is it red? You is say? it red? Is Hot it and painful? Is it? Or all of the above. So what is not your thinking? What do you think? If this I think it's uh, bacterial in, in infection. Uh, in, in, uh, that's no, no, number four. An injection induced 
but good reflection. Now let's see the reason I'm thinking, okay? Well, we can say we have fever, we bread, if we have swollen. Is it possible to be a bacterial infection? Yes, we cannot exclude it at percent right? So one may say this could be related to infection. Now, is it? Well, about the time, do you know a lot of bacterial infection after a vaccination site? Let's see now the evidence. What do you say? Ah, not that much. Yes. We all know those children, they were in emergency unit and they yes. say, oh my God, and they are giving antibiotics. Mm -hmm. But what we know from evidence, they usually bacterial even though it's a it's possible, a possibility, of yeah. course, we are talking now a differential here. Actually, this is not. And there is more some specific cause activity, which is due to tetanus yeah. antigen. You might know that tetanus, everybody responds to tetanus. We have no, no we have any non responder to tetanus. So some of the people in the Gaussian curve they don't need that much doses, since because they have high level of antibody, anti tetanus specific mm -hmm. antibody. And whenever you give the antigen, what do they do? This antibody, they cross react. So here it's what you have the causality assessment, you know, framework to see what do we know, plausibility, all I said. And here, so that for him. And here, what happens if you have a lot of antibodies, previous antibodies against tetanus, high level, you can measure that, and you put the antigen, these antibodies, they will cross react with the antigen with the component of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And when you have this binding site, you have all these cytokines, inflammation, and you may have this. And this is known as a heart risk phenomenon mm -hmm. or high sensitivity type 3 phenomenon, which is not bacterial, but is due to your antibody against the vaccine component. So now, what is the trick? No antibiotic, no fault. I think it's a treatment actually it works very, very well. Yeah. That's the point. Exactly. Highs works the best. And the, from my experience, I last two months, I saw a pregnant woman since because of pertussis vaccination. Uh, she had the last vaccine one year ago, so in one year and a half, so another pregnancy, so another GTAP vaccine. She had a heart like this. Very painful. This is very, very painful. And uh, she she wasn't supposed to take an inflammatory drug. And she was hesitating over with uh, um, paracetamol or whatever you want. I said, you know what? Put cold highs. I promise. We did this in the office. I asked my my assistant to put. Seriously, in a half an hour, we saw the difference. So very good reaction with with the with the cold back in case of that. Any inputs on that? Are you did you did you know about this this yes, phenomenon? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yes the, yeah. the thing is that uh, he had a fever, so that so makes it possible. The fever. No, you're right. You're totally right. You have to see that. we might have infection. No? We're not saying that it's, it's always excluded. The fever she had was due to the vaccine okay, component itself. as well itself. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the next? So to complete the mm -hmm. is okay that micro, micro, sorry, for the people in Zoom. Uh, for f fever control, uh, it is okay to use, for example, NSAIDs or not for uh, fever control. Because sometimes it's said that fever is okay because the body is okay. giving the a function, and if you control the fever, maybe the immune response cannot go well. Yeah, you're right. We had this study, uh, I think the run was involved, which showed that if you give before vaccine paracetamol, you may have less um, antibody levels. But in the end, 
efficacy in the real world was never compromised. So we had some evidence that if you give, the only evidence I found is that because a lot of parents at one point, they prefer to give something an anti-inflammatory, actually was paracetamol they studied, mm -hmm. like one hour, two hours before the vaccine. And these were followed. And with comparison to the other, the level of, of uh, antibodies are a little bit less, but still on the protective threshold. And we never had any evidence that in the real world, these people, they catch the disease because of what? paracetamol or anthropology. But it was a good, a good point. Yeah. So and what we often to... say is um, that once you have your innate response, which is, you know, fever is kind of a sign of the initial response, often it's enough to have already started the process and then you don't need the child to continue suffering. But once it has a fever, you can give something so that it feels better, right? And then, but so often we don't give it preventively, but then once they have it, you might want to give something. Yeah. And especially also if you look into other vaccines, for example, the, um, the shingles vaccine, the Shingrix, which is uh, the adjuvanted um, recombinant uh, vaccine, which is a huge reactogenicity in older people. Um, and here you can, without any hesitation, prescribe anti-inflammatory uh, treatment for the patients who have received the vaccine and otherwise will not come back probably for the second dose. <laughs> yeah, just a, a follow up to that. So, yeah, because I'm quite interested in that question because uh, where I come from in Nigeria is very common. Even the illiterate mothers know that you need to give, need, in quote, need to give paracetamol before you bring the child to the hospital. But now the worry is some of them are progressing to give uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. Mm -hmm. Do you have experience <clears throat> regarding use of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs <clears throat> before or after? Because if it's going to impede part of the inflammatory response, I don't know how it's going to affect the, the immune response to the vaccine. I'm, I'm not aware of studies. I think it's a field of interest, and there's people who are trying to figure out in mouse models or in, in studies to see the real impact. Uh, in real life, you have to ask yourself if you say to the mother, you don't give steroids or you don't give anything before you come in, is she going to come in and bring her baby? Or does she say, okay, if I can't give paracetamol before, I'm not coming? Um, so you have to kind of, you know, put right. put in balance. But I don't think that there is a, uh, a deleterious effect. Okay. Um, obviously, paracetamol might be better than giving um, non like yeah. uh, the anti-inflammatory. Also, depending on the age, where we don't want to give um, anti-inflammatory drugs yet. Yeah. Um, and it might theoretically less influence the immune response. Okay. So please, if you could share that paper, it might yeah, be very useful for some of us. If you type on one, Karen's you can look at Terence Gris, uh, paracetamol vaccination. I remember me, but we can find it. Yeah. 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 My, if I may, my <laughs> input from my practice, yeah. pediatrician practice, I see more mothers and children concerned for the pain that it will be, that the child will have with the injection more than the fever and to prevent the fever. And just to share an experience, I was, you know, just against these Emla patches or anesthetic patches saying, well, this doesn't work. Actually, I totally changed my advice. I usually now proactively say, next time you come, put the patch, and I see a big difference in compliance and acceptance to vaccine for children. There is also some nice study uh, performed by Anna Tadeo, which is a Canadian pharmacist, that she could prove that putting an anesthetic patch, even in adults, okay, reduce 30 to 40% of the nociception of feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot, you know, 30 or 40% of some uh, painful or disagreement you feel. I think it is a concern. And I'm now actually, maybe I'm just looking to present too much proactivity on that. And this is a really concern from, mother, from mothers on that. 
maybe you have another point of view. <laughs> I, I, just feel, I just feel really bad because the first vaccine, I didn't give it and she was crying for four hours. So oh, now I'm thinking no. I should have given some Emla. <laughs> no, I mean... Christian is a little baby. Yeah, yeah, so I, yeah I think everybody knows because I'm kind of, you know, yeah. just... And, and you vaccinated her yourself? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> but the, the pediatrician asked me if I'm feeling well and I said, why? And I was really white, I think, because she uh, was like strict yeah. like her for for hours. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. But I w wonder, do you see that in teenagers? Do you think it's more a psychological effect or do you really see it also in babies that you advise uh, Emla? So, I don't mean, It's true that I don't know where the concern of this Emla in babies, so I actually do not suggest to babies. Uh, I do the since two years of age. Yeah, the which I do. Um, I don't know, maybe I feel more comfortable on that, especially on children at four years old, typically, you know, especially if they are scared. And if the mother comes to the office and I see that in the, the child is scared, I say, listen, we, not today. I give her the MLAS, you come back, put it one hour before, and it goes very, very smoothly. Yeah. Well, uh, Sorry. It's just a Provocative question, is there a difference whether it's the mother or the father that comes? <laughs> uh, according to the teenager and uh, four years old, I have a look on the child. If it's not scary, you may say, okay, whatever. Uh, maybe fathers are more the one if I say we can delay the vaccine. No, 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 no. I don't want to come back. Now we do it now and we do not say, <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Uh, in my practice, uh, the the boy or the girl are not the issue. The parents are the issue. Convincing them, talking to them, make them think the way you do. The the kid in twenty seconds, you know what you you have to do. The problem. Are the parents? Yeah, you know the. Uh, yes, we, we know. It's true. Parents, yeah. <laughs> especially that. Especially. Kind of traumatized in me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to change? No. Very good. So I don't know if it's still me, Christa, and it's then true. you have a set yeah, of yeah, yours, yeah. right? Yeah, because we are there. That's true. But then I give you the yeah. I find myself talking too much here. Anyway, so now we have a Lily. We are in the same category. She's seven years. This girl presents a swollen and red arm. Okay, here on the right. It was the full arm. Difficult baby to distinguish here. Up to here, from here to here. After the fifth dose of the uh, data, this time, neither pain nor fever were reported. Hmm. No pain. No pain at all. What is it? We have the same possibility, and now we need a framework of Biological disability, what we know about it, do we know what is this entity? And the good thing, I think, when we don't know what it is, because we never saw it be before, how do we think? What is the plausibility? And maybe you can give a word of your thinking. I think this is more interesting to share. Mm -hmm. So is this a bacterial infection? No. Why? Can you can you open the mic and yeah? Uh, what? Because uh, there are not uh, bacterial infection signs like fever or, for example, pain. But actually, because 48 hours after the injection, I think that is a delayed uh, hyperimmunogenicity. Um, uh, my answer is B. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Okay. What do we know now about hyperimmunization this? We saw it before, right? Remember, antigen, you were there, you were here? Yes, yes. Yeah. So you had the antigen. You have the antibodies, and then you have all this cytokine. And what was, what was feature of this? Painful or not? Very painful. This is a big inflammation. Here we have no pain. I, 
yeah, well, that, my my comment was that, that there's no pain and therefore, but, and I'm not sure if it, it, it could be an allergic reaction. But then there would be then there would be then I would suppose that 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 there would be sensitization. Exactly. Um, so so I don't think it's that. So it must be C. So it's <laughs> allergy. Yeah, but from a knowledge, we would expect more symptoms, right? So it doesn't really go well. You see now the thinking, the causality, causality, causality assessment this is all about. So then of course you can go by exclusion because I think they give you a, a multiple choice. An injection would show who no, who no, who no, See. maybe this one, but what is it? Do you know anything called extensive swelling of a known etiology? No, no. You Google it, you find it. Okay. And we can find this is a very particular oh sorry. Okay, we skip the <laughs> So again, this is the, in the framework of probability a causal, a causal association that we can think, we just say how to do it. The document we gave you as a pre lecture that you must receive, you have this document, the sheets that we the yep. printed, yeah, you have it on your database. Please go in this WHO. A document which is really, really well done. Of course, it's like a Bible. Do not read it from A to Z, but go there whenever you need. And you have a very nice summary to explain how we can move to give evidence-based answer. And when we don't have evidence-based, how to use biological possibility. And this will frame our answer. Okay? So what I want to show you so to treat the entity, extensive swelling of the limb, is it described entity, happening up to 2% in children having a bigger tetanus acellularia pertussis vaccine. At the day, we don't have any clue of the physiopathology. We don't know what's going on. Some people argue they may be, you can be in the lymph, in the lymph, uh, root system because you do the you perform the vaccine here here whole the limb, the whole limb is swollen. I saw it once in a four months baby. I promise the the the, the right arm was double the other one. It's very very impressive because it's up to here to here. No pain, no nothing, and what we know it's not associated with. Maybe other complication. So you can continue the program of vaccination. So that's the expertise telling you this seems to be the DDDD. This entity is known, no part in the lane in vaccination. This is typically the question that we have about So that was just your comment to say, saying that it will it could be the, uh, via the lymphatics, but wouldn't that go the other way? Uh, we don't know. It, we are not proof. Is an hypothesis. I don't know. Uh, the upper, I mean, if you are blocked up here, then it swells down there, right? In this. No, I would just um, imagine if if you hit, if you really have some systemic lymphatic, if you, yeah, get it into the lymphatic systemically, I would expect that the pressure would bring it the other way yeah. down to down to the big. I don't know. <laughs> but you train. But would you? You wouldn't have much training that training that way, would you? No, but. The thing that should go drain from here and should go systemically, they can, if they can't pass, then it's ah, the same. Okay, so, like, so, you know, up yeah, so you have a, okay, that then, way. Then it's gone. Yeah. yeah. Because you close the limb, yeah. limb fast. Yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. But again, we have no evidence on this. This is only possibility. We don't know. We don't have a clue of what it is. How much time does it take to sustain? Sorry. How much time? Okay. What here? I was catching it before you, but <laughs> <laughs> how much time does it take to subside down? To go how much time it takes to go up? How many times? How much time? It takes weeks. It takes a long time. Very long time. It takes weeks. So, in that case, do you think it is related to the draining of the lymph node? I am sorry. I cannot... In that case, do you think it is related to the draining lymph node? If we, it takes, we don't know, uh, right? We, we don't know. We, so it's a hypothesis. It's like speculative. It might be, but there is no proof. I mean, there's no idea yeah. about really how it's it really works. unknown knowledge. So that's 
maybe should be studied with yeah. more evidence on it. We don't have any evidence of what it is. We know that this is not a life-threatening situation. We know that it goes away and you can give farther doses. The clinical vaccinologist speaking there, okay? And maybe there is a thinking, the physiopathology, we don't know. How many cases were there in in this paper, because it says uh, children, were four children, five, no, oh. no, 150, wow. something reported is like this. It's yeah. a big number, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's up to you, yeah. Okay, again, we skipped the, the question here, I'm sorry. Yeah, and uh, now we are back to something you heard this morning. Um, so you have a gynecologist who asks about the efficacy of pertussis vaccination in mothers during pregnancy um, to prevent disease in the newborn. And so the question is, is it more than 91% efficacy, 50 to 70, 20 to 45, or less than 20? You can ask there's some saying 50 to 70 percent, more than 91 percent. May I ask um, a question? Doesn't that depend on when the mother is vaccinated? Are we assuming? This is an excellent question. We are assuming that it is, um, I mean, not even, it's like this, the data come from a study that is observational. So it is recommended, it was recommended um, late second and third trimester. Yeah. yeah. So there might be even women who were vaccinated at the very end of the pregnancy, not early enough. So, seven days before. Yeah. Seven days. So very few optimists, some medium optimists about the clinical efficacy, but no pessimists. That's really nice. Um, so if we... Uh, look, um, so you all know that the burden of pertussis, especially in the Western countries, where we talked this morning about uh, neonatal uh, pertussis and hospitalizations here, baby is intubated, um, and a mortality rate of about 1%, and there's no nothing you can do, um, except you can vaccinate mothers. And here you see the vaccine effectiveness, so not efficacy, but effectiveness. Um, which is over 90% uh, when you vaccinate mothers during pregnancy. Before, we did like the cocooning and vaccinated everybody around the mother, um, and this is way less effective than if you give at the right time vaccines to the mother. Um, and here you see uh, if it's just in the week before or in the two weeks after delivery. Obviously, after delivery, there's no trans placental transfer anymore, and then the week before, you don't have time to do, the mother doesn't have time to do the peak response and her antibody response. So there is nothing more that she can transfer at the last days of, of pregnancy. So the efficacy, the effectiveness is really, really low, as you can see here. Um, but you would still have um, indirect protection by the mother not becoming infected uh, and thereby not um, transferring the infection to her child. Yeah. So you kind of get a cocooning effect by late vaccinations also. Yes, yeah, so if you get the late vaccines, exactly. The only effect you have is the thing. We know from monkey models um, that there is still colonization, even if you're vaccinated and even if you don't have symptoms. So it doesn't really 100% prevent you or prevent the mother from infecting her child. Um, but it's better than nothing, obviously. So, I mean, as soon as you find a mother who hasn't been vaccinated, you just go ahead, even if it's a day before C-section or something. Um, tot yeah, totally right. Um, this is just again to show you um, how anti maternal antibodies are transferred. You remember it's IgGs that go through the placenta, um, and it's an active transport um, through the layers. And these layers, they start being developed after 13 weeks. And then at the beginning, you have very low transfer rates, and then it increases with time. Um, and also, there's a very old study from the 60s where they did um, radio act, like radio labeled um, antibodies that they gave to mothers and then they looked how long it took to be transferred to the baby and it takes weeks so it's not right away when you give it that the next day everything is transferred to the baby through the active transport. This is why it's important to be better early than late when you vaccinate the mothers. 
Um, and this is a study you have seen that if you give it during the second trimester, you are better off than during the third, also because the third trimester goes until birth. And then if you are too late, um, then the mother doesn't transfer. And you don't benefit any preterm babies, right? A baby that's born at 30 weeks, if the mother has just been vaccinated at 29 weeks or something, the baby is already having few antibodies transferred and then even less because the mother didn't have the time to take her antibody response. So this is a little bit um, what we want to, sh to show about this. Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> What about the husband of, of, of the mother and how about the grandparents? Mm -hmm. you, you have to take the extra mile and all of them have to be also mm. uh, so vaccinated. Yeah, I agree. Um, very good question. So is it enough to vaccinate the mother? and not uh, the entourage, or do, does everybody need to be vaccinated? I think that everybody yeah. has to be vaccinated. It's the co 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 cocoon, yeah. uh, how do you say it? Co Cocoon. Co yeah. Cocooning. Yeah. So there is, um, at the beginning, what we did here in Switzerland, we did both, so we vaccinated mothers and we vaccinated the entourage um, to be sure that knowing that the efficacy of maternal vaccination is so high and the extra benefit of the vaccination of fathers and uh, grandparents um, is not that high in the sense of, I mean, the baby is protected by the antibodies that it received from the mother. Oh. If the mother hasn't been vaccinated at the right time, definitely, you know, you could vaccinate everybody around to have the cocooning effect. But it's less important when the mother has received the vaccination at the good time during okay. pregnancy, Perfect. each pregnancy. And the answer is here, right? <laughs> it's efficacy. Yeah. It's the efficacy you actually have if you vaccine the father. It's only 40% mm -hmm. of, of protection of the entourage. So when you see that the most efficient vaccination is to vaccine the woman while she's pregnant and every pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, and of course, for Cost effect. you didn't have the vaccine during the pregnancy, Having the vaccine of the entourage is still good because 38% of protection is better than nothing. Uh -huh. But definitely we have a better cost efficacy mm -hmm. um, intervention during the vaccine for what wow. matters. Yeah. Very good. Are you okay? It's you. Yeah. So this is mine? Yeah, that's it. So, So you have here David, six years old. He received the first dose of the hepatitis B vaccine. Okay, and he received that. Two days later, he was brought in the um, in the office for abdominal and joint pain with a palpable purpura. Purpura is a red rash that you can see here on the picture. The physician was a diagnosis of Henoch Schonlein uh, purpura. For those who doesn't know what it is, Google it, and then we can find what it is. It's a rheumatic, rheumatic disease disorder. And parents obviously accused accuse the immunization to have caused this worrying disease. Okay. Now. How does the event influence our immunization with the hepatitis B? The hepatitis B vaccine may trigger such that the hepatitis B immunization should be discontinued. You can say level one, I don't want to go farther. B, aluminum salts uh, may contribute to the vasculitis reaction because Echnoxian line is a vasculitis. <coughs> Hepatitis B vaccine is not the cause of legend. Any immunization may be continued as soon as clinical condition is stable. Or D, it's impossible to tell. And as a precaution, no vaccine should be given for one. So what would be your best option? Of course, here we don't need to find the answer, which is interesting here. It's how is your thinking here? What would you do? And before giving the last, you may say, what are you thinking now? 
you may say, oh, I don't know. And then we can give you some tips. It's lo it looks like a virus infection. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and, and I don't believe in any way that the HPV vaccine, the way it's made, could... could uh, Why? Hmm. Because it's too systemic. And this is it's very local. Systemic. You know, this, this vaccine acts very locally. Okay. That's my... Let, let, let us give you a little tip. The vasculide is an auction line vaccine. We know that this vasculide mediated by IgA antibodies. IgA, are you okay with that? We have different class of antibodies, and these ones are IgA mediated antibodies that you find on the felt vessel. Do you know which kind of immunoglobulin are triggered by a vaccine? Are those Ig? Okay. So just knowing that, what is your thing? In terms of plausibility, hmm. that doesn't look very unlikely, right? Because then optional line is AGA, and so that it took too short a time between the vaccination and the symptoms. Then you have the for the IgG to IgA switch to occur. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to our thinking, this is very very good. So we go back to this, and then we can still see where we are. So here we have the, the evidence. Hemoxone line is the AGA vaccine. Incidence, we know that there is an incidence up to 14 cases to 100,000 cases. So this could be temporal coincidence with the, this boy who was vaccinated. And usually, as you, I don't know who was speaking before, but very good. Usually the trigger, it, it, so there is a virus or whatever, especially two, three weeks before, because you need time for this antibody to interact with the vessel and to have the inflammation. So here, because of this 48 hours, the probability to, to have a causation between these two events is extremely low. This is the thing that we usually have to answer an apple. I think we have a 20 minutes. Is it okay for everybody to continue? You think, yeah, it's the pile of distance. 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 Yeah, it's the pile interest in doing the HPV one as well. Okay. So this is a European pediatrician and emphasis on European. Um, they sent you an email to ask the, for the HPV vaccine schedule in a 14 year old boy. And the question is, how many doses uh, do you need? So is it three doses at zero, one and six month, months minimum intervals? Is it um, only one dose that's required when the HPV vaccine is administered at older than 11 years old? Is it a two dose schedule zero and six months before the 15th birthday, or is a two dose schedule acceptable zero one or zero two or zero six? So the European. Yeah, this is a little bit uh, exactly that's a little bit the issue because it's different in every uh, uh, country, and then also there is uh, a new... from the last HPV uh, lecture that talked about the schedule. Uh, it, the new findings shows that less than two years, only one dose is required, and after two years, two doses. Yeah. It was the last update from the exactly, mother. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so this would be this. Yeah, we could just go um, go on. So usually you have heard about prime prime boost, but there are some vaccines at some ages where you don't need the two induction dose at one month interval, but you can skip one, and um, you see that here. Um, just yeah, exactly. So you have uh, four in Europe between 11 and 15, and obviously, so that's a little bit more universal now than it has been said in ADVAC, um, that between 11 and 15, you can do two doses, but not the interval zero one, but you still need six months between the doses, no? so that you induce memory response, right? Because otherwise you have two priming doses, it's too close 
to have the long-term um, efficacy. Uh, but then there is uh, data that show that when you're younger or if you don't have resources, you can already give one dose, and this is a very high efficacy as well. So this was something that um, I just wanted to go through quickly. This is a little bit in addition to the case before the little boy who came who had kind of a um, kind of a rush. This is another type of a rush. So this is a thrombocytopenic um, purpura. Um, and there is Linda who was hospitalized um, 12 days after her MMR vaccination um, that was given. Um, and she received at the time uh, intravenous immunoglobulins to treat this condition. Um, and now the question is, what should you do for the second dose? So if you remember last Friday's talk, on autoimmunity and vaccines. This might help you a tiny little bit about the etiology. Um, but then now um, the, the question is, MMR is known to possibly cause ITP. Um, a second dose of MMR is formally contraindicated. Risk of diseases are higher. A second dose remains indicated if serologies are negative, so you ask for a serology. Um, or you say risk of diseases are higher and the second dose might be given without further delay. Or you say um, the risk of diseases are higher and a second dose might be given, but should be postponed by six to 12 months from the time when she had received her first vaccine dose um, and treatment. So she had, she had so this is idiopathic from the cytopedic purpura. Um, what do you remember from the talk, what the autoantibodies might are targeted to and what this does in MMR, do you remember? Anyone remember? <laughs> no, you, you remember there was a structure as mimicry, right? Um, from the platelets and the measles and the it's higher in infection than compared to vaccination, but it's not idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, but it's just thrombocytopenia that is caused by this. Um, and you see here uh, a study that showed when you give MMR vaccination, you have an increase here in the six weeks after um, of hospitalization um, with uh, thrombocytopenia. And, and this is treated by immunoglobulin, right? Um, and so why do you want to wait six to 12 months before you give the second MMR dose, which was the good response? So you give immunoglobulins. Yeah. And with immunoglobulins, what do you give? You give antibodies against measles, right? Yeah. And MMR is what type of vaccine? Well, life attenuated vaccine. So if I give a life attenuated vaccine in an environment in which I just gave a huge amount of antibodies, it might not work very well. Right? So by precaution, um, one could say six months, there's different schools, but you might want to wait just for this reason, not for the reason that it induces this uh, thrombopenia. Lower on the second dose if you give the second dose, are you still at risk? Um, as far as I know, you're still at risk, but I'm you read the question. You're I still at the yeah, you're, you're still, <laughs> no, no, they are still at risk uh, at the second dose. Yes, yes. the same yes. risk, yeah. The recent risk yeah. is yeah. Second, yeah. second dose, dose. Perhaps, yeah, that is not excluded. Less than the first, first dose, dose. Okay. The first. so why would you? I mean. Yeah. I know we don't, or why, I mean, I know we don't typically check serologies to see if a second dose is indicated, but in a situation like this, why would that be a wrong? Actually, oh, you could do that. Okay. It, actually, we do. Yeah. yeah. But then you, it, there's a serology, I mean, there's other components into the Exactly. Right. And right. the, um, the correlate of protection. And so yeah. you don't do neutralizing antibodies for all the agents mm -hmm. that are in the vaccine. So, of course, you could see if you are protected against measles mm -hmm. by antibodies. But then for, for mumps, for example, to be sure that they are neutralizing, you know, you can have antibodies, um, mm -hmm. but they cannot be the right ones, which yeah. makes it a bit complicated. Right? Mm -hmm. and actually, the, for this, uh, the issue is for the mumps. Yeah, component. because you need to. Because we have, yeah. mm, even though you have antibody, yeah. you may have a so cross-reaction antibody that this is not correlated with with my with mums. But I might say it's for the two, three cases that I had in my experience with the ITP after measles, mother didn't want to have the second, mm -hmm. the second dose, and we can understand that. 
if we perform in serology and those for measles and rubella was positive, and even though we said, well, but we not, cannot guarantee that for the mumps component, we child would be okay. And all these mothers, since it was baby, they say, you know what? Because when we see you, when he's a teenager, we will see the real life. Yeah. May I ask which vaccination regime was this question regarding? Uh, yeah, but but how is that usually? Because in, in what in Denmark it's fifteen months and four years. Yeah, well, the schedule in Switzerland is nine months and twelve months. Ah, okay. It's a nine twelve month schedule, three months okay. long. So in Denmark, still the second dose is four years. Well, so but up there, it you, was eight, you don't I have. Think, you I think don't it have was circulation. eight years, and they moved it down yeah. to four years. But you're fine because you don't have a wide circulation because people are very well vaccinated. Yeah. In Switzerland, for example, oh yeah, you have epidem- You have some epidemics over there. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. 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 Yes. We have it at 12 months and at 18 months uh, because that was the mandate that the WHO gave uh, like three three years ago. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I don't know if that is done also in these countries or or every country has its own I think every schedule. country has it but its own way also how when children come to see pediatricians so that they don't come specifically for vaccines okay um and so it depends really on on, on the country, country. Even within Europe every country kind of does a bit differently okay thank you last subject okay and then we free <laughs> We can see yeah, the yeah. smoke from here, you know, shh, yeah. sorry for this. It's tough, we are not more students anymore. So, the question is, this is an healthy uh, 45 years old patient, thank you about this mutation, about COVID, but this just could be another topic, of course. He's concerned about the speed of vaccine development and long-term side effects. How do you respond to this kind of patient? You can choose to not engage with vaccine adaptation, which for a long time I did personally, and I explain it, and I repent. I'm very sorry for this. And I changed 15 years ago, so I'm serious. I've been traumatized for my own experience with a patient. Or you may say, I try to understand the concern of the patient. You may use motivation on your immune things. I know what it is, to address vaccine dependency. All you two have is your own strategy that you will share with us. Oh, by the way, just a participant on the uh, on the Zoom was making a comment on the chat. In Sweden, the second dose of MMR is 12, 18 months. Right. I just mentioned. So what do you think? No, that's the first dose. Sorry, can you repeat it? First dose is at 18 months. First dose in eight months. And the second one? And the second one? Where? Uh, seven, eight years. But I think your epidemiology can allow that because you have a very low circulation of the wild viruses. Yes. Yeah. And here in Switzerland and other rest of Europe, that's why we stretch these two doses just to prevent the what because we have epidemics every four or five years. You want to add something on that? If, if you ever have a in South Southern Africa, yeah, it's a mortality. Can you repeat this? I say, if you do that in South Southern Africa, for example, you would have a lot of mortality. If you wait till 18 months. Oh, to give. Exactly. So you yeah, have to adapt yeah. to the local epidemiology, of course. Another comment on that? In response to this question, I think that there are two uh, uh, responses. First of all, understanding the patients or the mothers concern, uh, understanding the concepts of the patient is very important, that the patient uh, wants to see that we know about these concerns, and then motiva- motivational interviewing techniques with be uh, If we cannot understand the patient, he will not understand us. If we want to persuade him, her, but if he thinks that we are not listening actively to her, he will not be convinced, and he will leave us. 
But I think that understanding the concerns why the mother is anxious or concerned about the vaccine. So by that way, when we listen actively about this concern, and then we could have interactive uh, interview with each other about the vaccine benefits, what happens to the society, what happens for your babies, you yourself, and everything else, and by this it works out. Thank you for this input. This was what it took to me to change my natural reaction. It was an horrible reaction, I say now, now, and I was against about vaccine hesitancy. I really repent when I say to this patient, if your Google research is compared to my medical degree, you can walk away. And she did. And it was a catastrophe because it's not the purpose of a doctor, you know. We have to be the coach. We have to have the advice. Long story short, uh, I went to metacognition thinking, you know, say what is in our mind. And finally, I knew, I think very late, the motivation of interviewing techniques. And then what she said, because first of all, I think that if I understood something, okay, this is to say that, of course, immunization is undisputable, and we are not arguing on that. But we know that, okay, as a professional. So the thing is, this was me before, not the real me, but my reaction, whenever I had any question, are you sure, doctor, that? It was like, okay. And then... <clears throat> We know that vaccine hesitancy is a concern, one of the on the top list of ten threat on the, the global health uh, threat in the world. Okay, vaccine hesitant folks are not antibacks. And here, if we you can see the spectrum. You guys have this patient that accept everything without asking any question, okay, because they don't believe in it. Some of them refuse. Because of, just the, because of the red against the blue. If you're talking about vaccine, I don't want to hear a doctor, I don't want to hear about vaccine, I'm not hearing you. Okay, fine. What this is the in, in between, we are just people who are questioning, doctor, whatever. Is it true that it may be a link with autism and MMR? So this one is an hesitant and it is legitimate to have a question. We all do. Who of us had no question about COVID vaccination? Raise his hand. So don't do it. But I think <laughs> it will get really nice. uh, So in a spectrum of 100 people, more or less, which is interesting, depending the area where you do the survey, you know that seven, 70 people out of uh, 100, they are usually accepted. 30%, they are what we call the hesitant. But again, only one or two of these people are anti-vax who are really against. So it's very important to, to define who's who and how can we respond, react to this patient. And that's basically what we said. First of all, we have a literature, and this was very helpful for me, when 10 years ago, I was starting to say to me, but guys, we should listen to the other people. Oh, no, come on, Alex, you don't pay attention to them. We are like, we are not bad, you know. So we have the evidence that all the interventional action that you may do, that's what I call, sometimes we vomit to the science. Scientists, no. No, 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 this is wrong, baby. I show you, look at this study. Actually, it doesn't work. A study has shown that it can also backfire if you do factual intervention. So, what works uh, more? Motivation of interviewing, which is a technique. Uh, I don't know if you know it well. It's a Bible from uh, Stephen Rolnick and Robert Miller. Those people study alcoholic, how to what can we do to alcoholics, alcoholic to quit alcohol or any kind of drug? He's not telling them, look at your liver, look at your uh, pronounced. No, we need something else. We need to engage. We need to listen. We need to be empathetic. And then to see what 
what did you need to quit alcohol, actually? What would you need? I mean, what is your question, actually? Because we doctors, unfortunately, we know which is best for the patient, right? And we want to convince. So long story short, motivational interviewing teaches us that first you listen, you define, and before giving any fact, give me the question. What is your question? Okay. This study from the Andre Gagneur, very interesting, showed that going in a maternity and just doing intervention with motivation on interviewing, just asking mother here, so you have a nice baby here, do you have a question with vaccination? If so, yes, I have a question with, I don't know, multiple sclerosis and hepatitis. Instead of saying, no, 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 there is no link, blah, 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 no factual intervention. What would you like to know about it? So you let the person ask his question and you only answer to his question. It's very difficult for us because we're giving the lectures usually as we, we know how to do. And very interesting, this study showed things that we never saw in the literature. This cohort of person went the interventional with motivational, found one year of age, there were more than 20% of vaccine adherence compliance compared to the other group of the newborns and parents who did not have, did not have the intervention. And then we have several studies showing again what it is. This is Stephen Gormick, which happened that I had a chance to meet him in Geneva during COVID period. And that's how, I mean, I had really the honor to know the Pope for motivational interviewing. And we did a kind of brochure and a webinar course specifically how to address vaccine hesitancy um, uh, with motivational interviewing. So my, whenever you have the chance to follow Stephen Rolnick, he's a wonderful psychiatrist and a very, very uh, thoughtful and inspiring person. To conclude, and maybe add other small talks and questions than we have, this is the address of the department. Do not hesitate, Christian or me, to ask any question after this, uh, this workshop, sharing the ideas or whatever you want. Christian, a little time for you to, to add the things that I might forgot or whatever. I think, uh, I think, I hope it helped you find something answer the question you might have had before coming here. Uh, I'll show you a bit about the clinical vaccinology and that it's not that simple. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions, you can oh. now or the other place. Yeah. For the end, Adam Grant has a book as the name of Think Again. And the end of the chapters, he talks about uh, for example, uh, the, hesitancy, the vaccine hesitancy, and for example, the new wave of meals in the U.S. because of the hesitancy, and it talks about uh, how the physicians uh, should uh, could actively uh, listen to the patients, to mothers about the vaccinations, and uh, it is a, a interesting book. And the last chapter talks about vaccine. Oh yeah. Which is the name of the? Uh, think again. Oh yeah, yeah, think again. Of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. Anything to add? Anything you want to share with us? Well, let me just share a little experience from my country. When COVID-19 came, I mean, we still have a very high level of hesitancy. But well, what happened is the vaccines were introduced very abruptly and there was no prior communication before the COVID-19 vaccines were rolled out. And during the first immunization campaign, we had a very low, extremely low immunization coverage. Now, during the second uh, round and the other rounds, we actively engaged local leaders and we engaged uh, like multi sectors, people in, in healthcare, people in local leaders, and influencers, because influencers could be an old lady in my your village who everyone listens to. And what we realized is just having these people involved, engaged, and getting them vaccinated first 
really, really helped push our vaccination performance from really low to levels that we could really not imagine. I mean, there's still vaccine hesitancy, but where we've come right now is because of just engaging other stakeholders who are held highly in the society. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very good. But well, it was a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. So I hope you can enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.